today's talk, of course, is uh, Akshay's. I'm tempted to say there's a whole Akshay Patram that's overflowing with the food of knowledge that we so crave. Uh, and so I propose that we start eating. All right. Um, so thanks a lot, uh, Shivram, for giving me this um, uh, chance to uh, present some of this work. So I'll, uh, um, uh, I think uh, what I'll do is to try to give, uh, so I don't know what is the uh, background of the uh, pe uh, people in the audience. So let me start with really basics. And as it goes along, uh, things will get more and more uh, interesting. And uh, of course, feel free to stop me at any time uh, with questions, uh, though I may decide that some of them will be bumped up uh, after the talk, uh, right? OK, so the problem that I'm interested in, uh, or the, the, the questions that I'm going to be talking about, are uh, on uh, uh, some very basic kind of problems for a very basic kind of model. And uh, my uh, aim in this talk is to really convince uh, at least some of you that uh, not everything is known even about such a very basic, very simple model. Uh, and uh, to try to motivate more people to, uh, to maybe look at these problems and to take them seriously. Right? Um, so uh, uh, there is an interesting history why I started looking at this problem. But maybe I'll come to it after all the talk is over. So not right now. So, uh, so the problem that we are looking at is the reachability problem for Markov chains. So what are Markov chains? So, uh, given that this is 5.30 in the evening, I'm sure people are at uh, various states of, you know, attentiveness uh, um, in whatever, in their uh, current state. So suppose we wanted to say, okay, we want to really map the mood of all these people in some sense, right? So, uh, so basically we have that some people are interested, right? Or even one of you. So let's take one person and we say, okay, so. Uh, currently, maybe I hope when you start, at least everyone is interested. But then, uh, as uh, time goes on, uh, or maybe after a, a couple of minutes, if I look at it, maybe some of you have become bored, while some of you are uh, still interested, right? So that's why there is a loop here. So how do I? So I'm just writing a transition system for it. And once you're bored, some may decide to check your mail, right? Or uh, uh, you know, check your uh, whatever it is that you want. And others may fall asleep, right? And uh, uh, of course, when you at some point, you may come back and so on. This is a very standard transition system. And we want to put in probabilities in a very natural way. So if you have a single person, you can say, what is the probability with which it's going to be bored or not bored? But if I'm talking about a collection of individuals, so everybody in this room, I can say, OK, after five minutes, how many of you are going to be in this state? And how many are going to be in the other state? So what is the? fraction of you which is going to go from being interested to being bored. Of course, this is a function of how good the talk is going to be, but we'll ignore that at the moment. Right? This is a transition system. So we can add probabilities as weights to these edges. Right? So these are transition systems. So you have states, and you have edges with weights on the edges. Right? And the weights are the probabilities. And, uh, the Markov, and this is basically what a Markov chain is. And uh, the, the, the crucial kind of uh, assumption that we make, or the definition, uh, or the crucial defining property, is that the transition probabilities, the probabilities, the weights associated, are only dependent on the last state that you have, not at really the history. right? So of course, you may question these assumptions at various points and say, oh, no, but your model is not good enough to capture what I want to capture. That's a different question. So that is not something I'm going to be focused on, though that's a very valid question. And if you want to talk more about that, we can talk. Later. So really, this is the basic model for probabilistic system. So how many of you already know uh, about Markov chains? Ah, so I can go faster. Almost everybody has lifted their hands, except for a few of you here. So OK, all right. So I hope now it's clear what uh, it is. So all we are saying that it's a transition system or an automaton with probabilities on the edges, right? Weights on the edges, which are, so the, of course, you can notice that from one state, if I look at the number of edges going out, the sum of the probabilities on those edges adds up to 1. Well, that is, you know, from some state, you have to go somewhere, either be here or go somewhere. And if I add all those probabilities, it better be. Right? So uh, in uh, some sense, your states could be, uh, so there are two points here. I think this should have come in later. So your states, uh, though this is a very uh, stupid example, 
uh, in general, this is a very, very, very descriptive model where your states could be anything. It could be, for instance, states could be web pages and your transitions could be probability that you click and go to some other web page. So you could actually, so you can think of the page rank, the Google page rank algorithm, which defines all your whatever Googling searches and so on, which is kind, kind of, you know, core of many, many areas as a being uh, working on an underlying Markov chain. Of course, uh, there might be more complications, but we are not interested in that. But at least we can think of a model as a Markov chain for this, uh, uh, for, for the page rank algorithm. Similarly, you can think of states as being current weather outside and the probability as saying the probability that the weather will change from sunny to rainy and so on. So you can have various, uh, various um, uh, uh, examples or applications. And so this is a, the, which is why this is really a basic model. So you can always put in more stuff, but this is a core model which occurs in lots of domains. Now, if you think about how to represent this, uh, you can actually represent this as easily as a transition matrix where you have the current state here and the next state. So basically, you're saying from, if I'm at currently at state one and I want to go to state one, uh, one in one step, the probability of that, that is remaining in state one is two by three. The probability of going from one to state two in one step is actually, there is no edge in this direction, right? So that probability is zero. And the other one is one by three and so on. So this is basically the transition matrix which describes my Markov chain. Is that fine? So the only property of this transition matrix is that it's a row stochastic. That means the row entries add up to one that we already discussed, right? So this is very simple. And it has many, uh, uh, I mean, it's not very uh, difficult to see that it has many linear, algebra, uh, uh, linear algebraic properties because it's a very core element of linear algebra, right? And you can really talk about, okay, so if I was in this uh, uh, distribution, so maybe when you came in, half the people who are in the room were interested and half were already bored to begin with, right? Then after one step, what happens? What is the distribution? That is how many of you are in various status and that's really this. So that's why it's a transition system and this gives the transition matrix, right? So, uh, and uh, 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 so yet another slight variant of this, another way to see this is to say that, look, I'm basically, what I'm saying is that every state, every configuration is a distribution over these small states. So half of them are here, half of them are there and so on. So it's really a distribution. And what the Markov chain tells me is how does a distribution get mapped in one step? To which distribution does it go to, right? So there are three, in some sense, slightly different views of the same Markov chain. A Markov chain can be either be thought of as a, just a transition system with probabilities, it can be thought of as a matrix and pure linear algebra, or it can be thought of as a linear transformer of distributions. And uh, actually we will swap between these uh, notions as and when we need them. So which is why it's important to see all these things. All right, great. So now I think we are all set up to uh, uh, do a little bit more things. So what is the problem? What is the basic reachability question that one may ask? So one may be interested to uh, find out if I'm given an initial state or an initial distribution over the states, that is half of them are here and half of them are there for instance, and I'm given a target state. Maybe my goal is to make sure that at the end of the talk, everybody is asleep. Right? So that would be 0, 0, 0, 1. Right? And uh, so that would be my target state. And my question that I ask is, okay, can you reach from a given initial state to a given target state with a probability equal to R? Right? Because this problem is not very uh, correctly posed. Uh, one question could be, I tell you in 10 steps, so in 10 minutes, can I go from here to here? So in each step, this transition happens. And in 10 steps, in 10 minutes, can I go from here to here? Is this easy to see? Why, uh, how, would, how would you do this? So in 10 steps, suppose I want to ask, all you need to do is take the uh, matrix, multi multiply it 10 times, and then check whether that entry uh, is going to be satisfying this property, is equal to R. So it's very simple. I mean, everybody knows this. I mean, even if you didn't know about Markov chains, you can see that this is correct. So there's nothing really uh, uh, fun happening there. Now, suppose I ask you, no, I don't want in 10 steps, but I want to say that in the limit on an average, on either on an average or eventually, at some point, eventually, is it the case that is as n tends to infinity, 
is it the case that I can go from uh, this state to this state with probability r? What is the average, uh, in other words, I can ask what is the average amount of time spent at that state, right? So, this requires a little bit uh, uh, more work, but most of you who know about Markov chains will already know this, right? So, this requires a little bit of basic uh, undergraduate level probability theory. And uh, uh, what is this? So, basically, the basic core property that you need is that if a Markov chain is a little bit nice, then you are guaranteed that from any initial distribution, if you allow enough time, you will go to exactly the same final distribution. You will tend to the same final, that is the limit goes there. So, that, uh, that probability and that is called uh, and it will tend to in fact a unique such stationary distribution, right? And uh, what is nice mean here? Uh, nice means for instance it could mean that all the entries in your matrix are all po strictly positive. So, they, none of them must be 0 or nice could mean that it is irreducible and aperiodic. That is kind of a much more general uh, framework, right? So, for those of you who know it is uh, of course obvious that this is the case, right? And uh, this is really what is called the fundamental theorem, sometimes called the fundamental theorem of Markov chains and the first thing that you would study in this area, which is that if I take for instance, suppose I take this simple Markov chain whose fixed point if you can see is this. What is the fixed point? It is a vector such that when I multiply this with this, it gets back the same vector. So, you can see that there is a unique such vector and starting from anywhere, I will actually limit as n goes to infinity, I will reach to this uh, vector when I raise the matrix to that power. I start from vector and I raise this matrix and I get to this vector. So, this is a theorem. So, I mean uh, again, it is not very difficult to prove, but it is probably a couple of uh, one lecture that one would and uh, this is true only if you have some nice assumptions, but even in general, even in general you can do the similar kind of reasoning. So, you can uh, instead of looking at uh, 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 just looking at uh, uh, the whole Markov chain, you can break it up into smaller parts which behave nicely and still answer the same question. So, I am not going to go into the detail for those of you who know, you are already, you already know it and for those who do not know, take it my, take my word for it that this can be done for general Markov chains, okay. So, now comes the interesting part, okay. So, uh, basically the, uh, the question that we have asked is a basic reachability problem where we said, okay, reaching in, uh, if I give you n steps and if I ask you what is the probability uh, to go from here to there, is the probability equal to r to go from initial to target state in n steps, this is trivial. In the limit, it is not trivial, but it is very easy. It is a first course, few lectures, a few, uh, few uh, whatever reading of lecture notes and you will get it. So, here is a third question that I would like to ask which is very similar to this. Uh, is it the state that you can go from the initial, is it the case that you can go from the initial state to the final state uh, uh, in uh, uh, with the probability equal to r in some n steps? You see the difference between the first and the third? So, n is given in the thing, the first. So, then you could do m power n, right? And I ask you, Okay, is there, does there exist n such that m power n, so I can do m power n and I take the initial state and the target state, then I get the, uh, this number r. Is that, is the problem clear? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. 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 Uh, no, not eigenvalue 1. Eigenvalue Markov chains always have eigenvalue 1. Yeah, yeah. In fact, sorry, rows will sum up to one. So that's always true. I can, there is always one eigenvalue one, and all the others are strictly less than one. What I'm asking is, is the stationary distribution? Sorry, uh, I'm asking the station. Uh, can you compute the stationary distribution? Right? Is the stationary distribution does it have equal to R or something? Yeah. Uh, the niceness property basically says that uh, there will always be that unique stationary distribution. Otherwise, it may not be unique, but you can still figure all this out. That's essentially the idea. So, uh, yeah, exactly. That's it. That's it. That's exactly it. So, uh, you, uh, so for instance, if I take, uh, can you see this? This one. This one does not have a unique fixed point. Convince yourself that that is the case, right? So, this is a very simple matrix, and you can see that. Uh, basically, what is this uh, saying? Uh, it says as a state, it says that uh, whatever, if you are here, you go there with probability 1 and go there with probability 1. 
So you are never going to be in the same state forever, right? So you are never going to converge. So that's that's a very uh, uh, yeah that's a, that's an easy part I would say, right? So trying to characterize that. Uh, we'll come back to the eigenvalue part because that's really going to be crucial to the rest of the uh, remaining part of the talk. But here, uh, what I want to ask is, so does there exist a finite number n such that I can reach from initial to target with probability r in exactly n steps? So what do you think about this problem? Is it going to be as easy as this or harder or any comments for those who have not read the abstract? So the crux of this talk, and I could actually stop the talk here if it were a three minute or a whatever, a 10 minute talk and so on, is that, uh, oh yeah, so before the crux of the talk, yeah, so this is, this problem is open. And again, what is this problem asking? The problem is asking if I start with the vector in which I have one at the state S and uh, I look, so start from state S and I apply M n times and I reach the state T, is this probability. So one, so this is uh, just a symbol to say it's the uh, vector which has one in the sth position and zero everywhere else, right? So I'm just asking is this equal to R? And this question is still open. So what do I mean by it is still open? So let's uh, let's understand what it is. So so uh, let me restate the problem so that everybody is clear that how easy the problem is, right? So I mean to state. So in other words, all I'm saying is take any row stochastic matrix, right? And I ask and I give you some two indices of the matrix i and j, and I uh, give you a, ra a rational number. Uh, and the question is, does there exist an n such that m power n i j is equal to r? This is it. All right, and uh, what do I mean by this problem is open? Can you give an algorithm for this problem? So, can you give a procedure or an algorithm to check whether such an n exists or not? This is it. This is the question, and uh, actually, this problem in its full generality is open, right? So, is that uh, Abiram? Is that fine? Yeah. Ah, no, so that is the point. So uh, that's the next slide. So good, good. So uh, uh, so let's end this slide and you will uh, get the answer to your question. So it's open, but exactly how hard is it? So in other words, so suppose I uh, my R was 0 or suppose I want to know whether it's going to be equal to 0 or something, right? So the probability of going from here to there. For that, I don't even need the probability. I can just do some graphical uh, uh, analysis on the graph of the Markov chain and decide it. So actually this problem, the hardness of the problem is not there everywhere. It's not uniformly hard no matter what the R is, no matter what the this is. What I mean by it's being hard is there are some particular bad values of R where this problem is really, really hard. Everywhere else it can be solved. So in particular, suppose I ask, uh, take this as my uh, uh, Markov chain and I ask, uh, is it the case uh, that uh, we will go eventually to uh, some value, let's say half. Right? So from, is it the case that I can go, does there exist an n such that uh, uh, I can go from pro, uh, state 1 to state 2 in n steps with probability equal to half? This problem is easy. So what is the hard problem? It becomes hard when, oh, okay, there is, uh, okay, fine. So it becomes hard when, when uh, this r is exactly the value of the fixed point, the coordinate of the fixed point at that point. So if I ask you, is the probability, uh, does there exist an n such that I can go from state 1 to state 2 in n steps, is that probability equal to 4, and 4 by 11, then it becomes hard. So this is really the, uh, the distinguishing thing. So why is this the case? Because if, it, if I'm only asking whether it goes to half, I already know that there is a unique fixed point and I know by fundamental theorem that it's always going to converge to this point. So there is a finite time very soon in fact, in fact you can do a very easy algorithm which will say that okay after this point it can never come closer to half, it must go only, it will stay within a very small area around this point. Yeah. So we don't know what monotonic convergence is there. So that is exactly the, so the second hard question which again has got cut off is what is the behavior around the limit point? 
So is it is there a monotonicity property is the second problem and we do not know the answer to this. So I would like to in this rest of the talk actually convince you that there is no easy answer to that question of whether there is a nice monotonicity. Uh, can I say that it always approaches from above or can I say that it always approaches from below or can I say it keeps switching in a regular way. That is you know there is a regular automaton which can tell you how it behaves around the fixed point. All these questions are in some sense equally hard not well I would I do not know whether they are equally hard but uh, all these questions are uh, are going I am going to show various types of hardness for these questions right yeah. Yeah. That is right. So basically uh, uh, think of it this way so uh, I mean if I I have that picture coming in later, but now itself we can talk about it, right? So basically, uh, if you write in two dimensions or three dimensions, you each uh, I can think of this as a each uh, distribution as a point in that n minus one dimension, right? Because uh, whatever it has to add up to one, so it's going to be in a smaller dimension. And I can ask how does this point? So when I apply m, it's a linear transformation, so it takes this point and goes to some other point on this space of distributions. And I am really asking how does this behave around the fixed point? That is the question, right? So, do not worry, there are nice pictures coming in which will illustrate uh, this point. So, I just want to give an abstract notion of this and then give an idea of why this is interesting other than being an interesting theoretical problem and then go into uh, exactly what the behavior is uh, in that. So, exactly what you asked for. In this simple case, yes, uh, where it is a nice matrix. So, in a nice matrix, uh, uh, the algorithm is very simple. The algorithm just says that uh, you know that you are going to converge eventually to the fixed point and you are going to converge exponentially fast to the fixed point by the rate of convergence. So, you just need to check for some amount of time after, and you know not only do you know that you are going to converge uh, because uh, you know that you are going to monotonically converge in the sense that at all times you are going to come closer you keep coming closer to this point. So, the distance decreases in a uh, yeah in a way. So, therefore, if uh, if my other point that I want to reach if r was something else I will be able to say that there exists a, some I can compute actually a polynomial bound on the n in fact quadratic or something like that a bound on the n such that after so many n steps. I will be in this ball and therefore I can never hit that. So, take any two points if this is the fixed point and that is the r I will just draw a ball separating it and I ask after which point is my trajectory always going to be inside this ball right. So, that question is easy and in that sense monotonicity is there. But now suppose this r was exactly this then no such ball can be drawn. Then suppose I want to ask is it the case that I always came from above that I do not know all right ok. Uh, okay, so I'd like to uh, before going into uh, the uh, ideas of uh, so so uh, uh, again we we really want to understand how hard this is. So uh, I mean I can't just say hard. I can't just say it's open and expect you to all believe me, right? So I'll try to motivate why it is hard or wh what is the hardness, and that's going to be actually a bulk of the talk. But before that, I'd like to give uh, some kind of motivation from where actually I got interested in this uh, uh, these kind of problems. Just to say, what does formal verification have to do with this in some sense, right? Yeah. I mean, equal to R. I mean, equal to R. But suppose you tell me, okay, I do not want, uh, what do I care about equal to R? Suppose I want to ask strictly greater than R. Yeah. One, uh, so, is it the case for all n, is it the case that I was always above R? This problem is also hard. And in fact, that problem is also open. Huh? Uh, you're, yeah, I wish it was that simple. So, uh, but no, so that problem is also hard, and we're going to say why that problem is also hard. So, uh, you're right. So, that problem is in fact more interesting than asking just whether it's equal to R. So, these two are two different problems, and there are a complete different span of results on both of them. And I'd like to mention a few of those uh, in the talk. Okay. So, I'll just give a two two slide motivation. Uh, for the kind of problems which got me interested in this. So, uh, 
uh, I mean this is a uh, for instance a biological example okay. Uh, so here uh, basically what we have uh, is that uh, we want to actually look at the variation in the population of a yeast. Uh, yeast is some chemical uh, not chemical whatever some uh, biological organism right. So uh, a mar uh, under some stress as shown by some marker right. What is a marker chemical marker we do not care about all this right. So essentially what the idea is is that uh, there is a bunch of experiments that people do and they try to model what happens when yeast are affected with are injected with some chemical marker okay. And uh, they look at the population and this is a study that they have actually done. So for instance this particular one is taken from this paper and uh, uh, one can think of a, uh, so basically you are looking at a population. So one can just as we started in the example in the beginning of the class how many people are there who are at attractive state. I can talk about the states being the concentration of this marked yeast in the different populations. High population of concentration of marked yeast, medium level of population of them, uh, low level of population of them and the transitions are really what is the proportion of yeast which move from here to there at one alright. So again this is not necessarily the best model but this is a model and uh, at least according to some of the biologists well why not this is another uh, good enough model in the in the sense that there is no better information known. So this could be a very ah uh, there is a lot of thing which is getting cut. So I have uh, not lot actually in this case only the page number got cut so this, yeah. So what is the parameter, so that is an another interesting problem. So it is not that that is the only interesting problem. There are cases where people are interested in this, there are cases where people are interested in that. In uh, So I will try to, I will give a list of problems and then you can see whether yours fits in here or you want another problem. So that, so all I am saying is that this is the model. So currently I am not talking about what is the problem, right. So currently this is the model and so I have states where this is high, this is medium, this is low and there are transitions which say with what probability. Uh, it moves from uh, uh, whatever the concentration moves from here to there right. So this is basically the idea and uh, this is just actually to motivate the point that I am actually interested about patterns which are formed by this. So if initially there is uh, one third concentration in each of the states right then is it the case that uh, the population with the high concentration always is above 5 by 12. This is a valid question right no matter what the parameter is given the uh, current parameters under which, uh, under which they are working, they want to ask from the initial distribution which is in this uh, some way of concentration, is it the case that the population with higher concentration is always above 5 by 12 or you could ask uh, is the whatever the, the low population having high concentration does it satisfy some nice structure. So is it the case that it was very low first and then became high and then became low. Right. So you can ask any such question and all of these questions are interesting for different reasons right. So uh, so again uh, so we seem to be so the, now coming to your issue right we seem to be talking about these graphs in the air and so on. So let us try to make it a little bit more concrete what is it that we mean. So really what we are saying is that there is some so at least for the simple problems we are saying there is a threshold value and I am actually when I say it is above and below I am actually saying it is above this threshold or below this threshold. So in other words. I can actually talk about saying that I will take this uh, space of all probability distributions and I partition it saying that okay this is uh, this is above and this is below right. So it is just some partition and that partition is given by the biologist let us say right. So maybe that biologist is interested really in whether it is above 5 by 12 or not. So 5 by 12 becomes the threshold yeah. Uh, actually the biologist needs such a breakup into high medium and low because anyway they cannot do any better. So they do not uh, they I mean usually they work with a very noisy framework I mean there is a valid criticism which I will come to later but that one is actually from the biologist. The fact that there is a discretized interval which is high low medium or maybe it is not high low medium maybe it is high very high low very low medium it is possible but they need a discretized interval because anyway all their experiments all their data 
everything actually uh, so for instance if they are looking at some uh, blot they are going to look at finally uh, some discretization so so i will mention this at the end of the talk why so uh, yeah so yeah so no you go ahead It depends on the model. Sometimes they do, sometimes they have no clue. Sometimes they don't even know whether this is the right model. So they don't know what the steady state is. Yeah. 0.4 is. Yeah. I think in, in most cases they will be happy with the answer. But I may want to also ask whether there is some pattern which is followed. And with respect to that pattern, maybe they are not happy with my saying whatever I want to say. Right? In some sense, am I solving their problem or am I saying, okay, I can't really solve your problem, so let me solve some other problem and you better be satisfied with that. So, I mean, there are both ways. I think currently, in fact, uh, what we are saying is do exactly what you are saying. Don't bother about the exact value. Uh, let's just give an approximate answer and that's good enough. And I'll show some results about that. That's finally our solution also. To say that anyway, the biologists don't care about the thing. So, in terms of the practical application, we don't care. Uh, we don't really care whether it's exactly 0.5 or 0.42 and so on. But yeah, but the uh, crucial point to note here is that I mean, actually, this is where the theorist in me comes out, right? So this is where I say, okay, look, that's okay. I can solve it for them in this way. But I would like to understand what is this point? What is this magic point that I'm not able to solve? Wh what is the hardness of that point? Is there something really hard in it, or is it just that I don't know how to solve it? So that's where I go into. Uh, more theoretical study of this. So one may question as to whether the practical applications are there and my answer is twofold. So in some cases, they also need it. In other cases, even if they don't need it, I as a uh, theoretician, I am interested in. Yeah. Yes. 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 We could, we could. No, we could, we could, we could do all this. We can look at uh, parameterized Markov chain. We can look at continuous time Markov chains. We can look at uh, interval Markov chains. We can look at um, MDPs uh, because why have deterministic structures? Why not have decision-making capability? So a better model would be all of this. I want to take the simplest model that I know of and already show these results. And uh, yeah, you can say okay, but would simplify. So that's a valid question. So that could be one way, another way of tackling it. Just as approximation is one way, parameterization is a yet another way. So these are all ways to tackle the problem. But we have not yet stated the problem in this setting. So let's understand the problem. Then we can have different discussion on various ways to actually tackle the problem. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I'm in this talk only going to say how the results look, but there is a student here who has the code for that, who can tell you exactly how it looks like. <laughs> who is not sitting here actually? Huh? Yes. Oh, this is thank you for this question because that's exactly what is coming. <laughs> so, so uh, very good. Uh, I mean, that's if I end up saying everything about that talk, I think I'll stop at that point. Right. All right. Uh, so. So I think now everybody agrees this is a nice problem. This has nice theoretical components. This has some vague practical implications. Uh, and uh, yeah, so yeah, so yeah, in some sense, this oscillation, does the trajectory, this is your question. This is exactly my question. So this is exactly the kind of question that I ask. Is it the case that can I have an oscillating behavior or some regular behavior? So in fact, I don't want to just talk about oscillating. I want to say, is there some regular behavior? If I give you any regular uh, behavior described by regular automaton or writable, whatever, uh, you can write it in uh, LTL logic or something like that. Can I do uh, uh, everything that logic can say? Can I answer every one of those questions? Okay. Uh, yeah. So for instance, this is a symbolic trajectory, this, or it, is it B, whatever, B A uh, omega or something like that, right? Is it below, above, below, above, and so on. Okay. So I'd like you to note at this point that these trajectories, these symbolic trajectories, once this partitioning is done, is actually a word over a finite alphabet. So automata theory comes sneakily into the picture, right? 
So we are going to have basically what we are saying is that instead of looking at these real values, I'm looking at this partitioned alphabet. And over this, I can now, for instance, here I just say I am only interested in whether it's below or above. So the trajectory I'm interested in is below, below, above, above, below, or whatever it is. And the oscillation question is just asking, is it the case that eventually it forms the pattern B A B A B A or something like that, right? So you can write these formulae uh, in some kind of a logic, okay? Uh, and uh, so that's uh, yeah. So okay. So this is this is about single trajectories. But we were not interested only in single trajectories, and this is again, again uh, motivated from uh, some uh, biological uh, uh, motivation. Uh, and where I say, okay, what if the initial distribution was not a single point, but actually a parameter version? So there is a range in which the initial distribution is. So you know that uh, whatever, uh, one of the, uh, maybe you know one of the things exactly, but the other things you know only in a range. Then what you get is not a single word, but you get a set of words. And this, if this set of initial distributions is a big set, whatever, if it's, for instance, a, uh, if it can be anywhere between half and one third, I get an infinite collection of trajectories which come above. And I want to ask, do these infinite collection of trajectories, symbolic trajectories that, I, that come here, do they all satisfy some property? Like, do they oscillate forever? These kind of questions. All right? Uh, yeah, so for instance, these are different trajectories. So this one, so if you can see, yeah, the coloring is completely heavier. But uh, you can see that actually all these three trajectories, starting from here, remain above B all the time. So is it the case that if I start from an initial collection, they, the whole set of trajectories remain above or not? So this question slowly becomes a question not only about a single trajectory, but a set of trajectories and how they behave over time, right? So this is really the patterns that I'm interested in, which was in the abstract of the talk, right? So what is the way these things evolve over time? And uh, 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 yeah, so this allows us to move from words to languages. So if we knew, for instance, uh, yeah, so, uh, so, and I'm going to use this notation. So let me just fix this notation. So this symbolic language, we will denote as the language of a Markov chain with respect to an initial set of distributions. And for my talk, all the initial distributions I'll think of as product of some initial intervals. Actually, I need only them, uh, need them to be a convex set of initial distributions. Then all the kind of things that I talk about will be fine, right? And if this language were regular, then I can really ask if, 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 if this language was regular, then I can ask, uh, you know, does it satisfy the oscillating property? Does it satisfy something else? I can do pretty much whatever I want to do. Is that, is that clear? Uh, yeah, and we can, so, yeah. So now let me give the formal description of the problem, and uh, it's 6 o'clock, so I have, perfect. So now, so this is, I hope this is the, whatever, the introduction of the talk, but actually, no, I'll come to the outline after this talk. So this is, all the problems that we are interested in. And now you can ask me whether there are other problems of interest to you. So basically, we start with a Markov chain. We start with some distributions. And in it is the collection of distributions. We start with a threshold value, some value which is going to distinguish what is interesting and so on. And uh, we start with a discretization of the space. So in general, we'll be interested in some random discretization. But in this talk, I'm just going to be interested in whether it is above, so the only discretization is whether it's A or B. This is the only thing I'm interested in. So in other words, uh, A or B with respect to this lambda, right? This lambda defines whether it's above the threshold or not. And so the words are over this alphabet. And the questions we are interested in are, does there exist an integer n such that mu, that is that initial distribution, dot m power n dot sigma is equal to lambda? Then for all integers n, is it the case that uh, this thing is greater than lambda? So these are basically the kind of questions you guys, uh, you were already asking me. So, and so basically all these questions. So is it the case that from an initial uh, uh, distribution, does it satisfy some regular pattern? Or is it the case that the whole bunch of trajectories that I start from this initial convex set satisfy some nice pattern? So all these are very valid questions. And one can generalize this uh, to very nice things, which automata theorists have already developed if this language were regular, all right? All right, so that brings me to the uh, outline. So I hope the technical problems are clear. So these are, uh, from now on, I will be interested only in these problems uh, and their links to various other problems. So we'll, again, take a lot of detours, but hopefully the uh, idea is clear what these problems are and why they are interesting. 
So this is going to be the uh, real uh, outline of the talk. So what I have explained till now is just the statements and why they are interesting. So what we are interesting, uh, interested in this talk is to really understand how hard they are. And uh, uh, the way we do that is by linking it to another well-known hard problem. Some of you may already know this. So how many of you know this problem called the Skolem problem by a show of hands? Oh, very good. So you're in for a, for a good surprise, let me say. So uh, in fact, then, yeah, OK. So yeah, so you, I think that's going to be the interesting, um, one interesting part. So let me spend a lot of time on that. And then depending on how much time is there, I will actually talk about the results that we have about these trajectories and so on. But even if we don't get here, I hope, uh, I mean, we are in the same department, so I hope all of you will be, can come and ask me at any point of time, right? Uh, and uh, actually what I'd like to do is also talk about links to various other problems. And one particular problem which is of interest at least to some of us, so Prithik has been working on this also for a long time, is that right to say that? <laughs> uh, is about program termination, why is that linked to this problem, right? So, the, uh, so I'd like to, uh, at, though I have written it this way and I will be presenting some results, I may push things under the carpet so that I can get to uh, telling you all the various links of this nice problem that we have looked at. All right. Any questions at this point? Because now we are going to go into a, a so it's like part two of the talk. So till, so if you have understood till here, I think you've got already the bulk of why this problem is interesting and what the problem is. So, uh, but next we are going into a different uh, direction, which is about the links to uh, the Skolem problem. So if you have any questions, this is, would be the right time. All right. OK. So yes. Hmm. They become undecided. Uh, two state MDPs. So uh, oh, no, no. OK, OK, OK. Sorry, MDPs is different. So because actually for MDPs, things become OK. Uh, Markov chain with two states, no. These are not decided. Uh, these are not uh, hard. In fact, for Markov chain with two states, all these become uh, solvable. Three, Three they are already hard. That will come in this. So my counter examples, which I'll give for hardness, will be uh, will require a dimension of three, and that is really related to the uh, eigenvalues, which that already pointed out, right? So uh, the structure of the eigenvalues, or is it what the values of the uh, whatever the are they from are they complex or real? Basically, is going to decide whether these problems are easy or not. We'll come to that. Yeah, so this one, so this doesn't have a, a, a multiplicity two, but it has two, uh, uh, so zero one and one zero are both uh, uh, points which are, right. For the, which one? For this one or the identity? Yeah, so this one there's one and minus one, right? No. Right? So that's okay. No, this is not a nice matrix. So this one, uh, so wait, oh sorry, I think I've drawn something wrong here. So this might be a nice matrix. It's the other one which, no, no. Uh, so is this a nice matrix? Uh, okay, in some sense it is a nice matrix, and in this case we will be able to solve it. But so, for instance, to make life uh, interesting, uh, so this one I just wanted to show. Yeah, in three by three, I have an example. We'll come to that. We'll get non-trivial things. That's why his question is very valid. For two two by two matrices, things become too easy. Uh, things uh, actually become uh, too nice. So for instance, in this one, uh, if you look at, um, um, so what I mean is that this point, this does not have a unique limit for this one, right? So that's all I'm talking about. So for me, in this particular sense, this is niceness. So this limit does not exist is all I mean. So but I agree with you. I mean, the, what is nice and which is exactly the nice matrix? Two to, by two by two, anyway, I'm not going to be interested in. I'm going to be interested in more complicated matrix. matrix. Yeah. yeah. It's beyond this that we are interested. That's right. So this is not an appropriate example for what I want to uh, talk about. Anyway, the hard things that I want to talk about uh, occur only after three by three. 
So at two by two, things are very nice. And we'll come to that if we have, uh, depending on how much time we have, we'll come to that. And even in the hardness, you will see that you require such a blow up for uh, things to become not so nice. All right? Uh, yeah, so, okay. In other words, my niceness is not formal enough to me, uh, for me to be able to say whether this is nice or not, because there are different notions of ni niceness for different properties. So let's, uh, let's kind of push that under the carpet. Uh, all right. Okay, so uh, so this question I think all of you know, right? So uh, so uh, this is like a new start, fresh start. Uh, talk two is beginning here, right? So this is uh, a Fibonacci sequence. So this is the sequence. Uh, I, I does is there anybody here who does not know what a Fibonacci sequence is? I presume not, right? So it's a very standard Fibonacci sequence, and it's given by the recurrence relation, which is u n equal to u n minus one plus u n minus two, right? And with the initial conditions of u u one equal to one and u zero equal to one, and you can see that that describes what uh, uh, the multiplication of rabbits in PISA or whatever it is, right? Uh, but this is not a very good recurrence, right? I mean, for rabbits, after all, rabbits keep dying. So this recurrence relation that they it's just u n minus one plus u n minus two basically seems to require rabbit, rabbits that live forever, right? So I think a more complicated example would be to take into account the fact that, you know, three generations down the line, rabbits do die. So you are reducing something. So, okay, so don't ask me exactly what the recurrence is. I have no idea. But all I'm saying is that if I look at a more general recurrence relation with, again, some initial value, and I ask you this question, okay, I give you some more general recurrence relation like, like this. Will the, now is the interesting question, do the rabbits ever die out? That is. Is there a point at which u n becomes zero? All right. So is that an easy enough problem? Okay. Uh, so before we go into that again, uh, yeah. So the uh, it doesn't matter. You've not missed out anything here. So this is in general called a linear recurrence sequence for obvious reasons. So uh, and uh, basically, if the nth value depends on only k previous n values, the order of this recurrence is called k order. Right, order or length or whatever, it's called k order. Uh, depth is called k, and the constants uh, a1 to a k minus one are all some constants over some field. So basically, we can take it to be integers. We can take it to be uh, more complicated things. Right now, we are only interested in integers, but we'll worry about other things, and that's it. So this is actually called the Skolem problem, and it turns out that this problem has been open for 80 years. So so this essentially means that uh, such a simple problem, whether a general linear recurrence sequence ever has a zero, is already a very uh, hard problem. Which is, and this problem, unlike the other one, has received a lot of attention. So uh, in fact, yeah. So this is a little bit cheating to say it's 80 years old because 80 years back, decidability itself was not really clear. So let's say that it was uh, 1952 was the first published paper about how hard this problem was and so on, right? But why is it called at 1934? Yeah, so in fact, to tell you that this problem has received a lot of attention, uh, here is a quote by uh, Terence Tao, right? In his blog in 2007, he has this quote, which is that it's faintly outrageous that this problem is still open. It's like saying we don't know to decide the halting problem even for linear automata. There's a linear recurrence and you want a halting problem and you don't know how to solve it. So note, here we are not asking for the complexity. We are asking whether it's decidable. It is currently not known whether it's decidable, right? For an arbitrary order k. And now we can, as usual, look at variants of it, right? Oh, what if we are not interested in whether it's equal to zero? What if we are only interested in whether it's for all uh, always is it greater than zero? Actually, that was that should have been the uh, rabbits not dying problem. Always it's greater than zero. Anyway, so I hope the spirit of the idea is clear. And so that's the positivity problem. So the positivity problem asks whether for all n, is it the case that the nth entry is greater than or equal to 0? Uh, the ultimate positivity problem asks whether there is a point after which this is true. That is, there is a point after which it's always greater than or equal to 0. So these are related variants. And uh, just to tell you that this problem, unlike the other one, has been really well studied. So this problem, for instance, was uh, uh, originally, and this is why it's called the Skolem uh, problem by some people. Other people actually call this something else, PISO problem, I think. Uh, so this is uh, originally there is this theorem of Skolem, Mahler, and Lech. So Skolem proved it in 1934, 
and uh, Mahler and Leck, I think, in, uh, so he proved it for integers and it was raised to other things as well. So you don't need it to have integers as well. And so, on. so there are various variants of this problem. Uh, and um, uh, basically that theorem uh, says a very nice thing, but I, I don't have time to really uh, talk about the nice things that that theorem uh, talks about. Uh, basically what it says is that if you want to ask whether there are infinitely many points at which it's zero or not, that question is decidable. Whether it's finite or infinite, the number of zeros, whether it's finite or infinite is decidable. It's whether it's zero or non-zero which is not decided, uh, which is not known. Which is not known. Could very well be true. So that is actually a very old result. And then uh, people uh, in various, uh, so there are a whole bunch of papers uh, which showed uh, the decidability of both this column and the positivity problem uh, for various orders. So now if you take just the order 2, so this really corresponds in our matrix case to the size of the matrix, which uh, really, you know, number of states in the matrix. So this is exactly the same thing. So what was shown is even for 2, 3, 4, there were 3 separate papers actually, or 5 or 6 papers over these 3 results. And re re recently, that is about 2 years back, there has been a rich uh, haul of results on this topic. And uh, this is by... Uh, these two people, uh, professors from uh, uh, University of Oxford, uh, Joel Wagner and James Worrell, and they have uh, a whole bunch of papers and their best result, which got, I think, the best paper award in ICALP 14, says that ultimate positivity uh, for a subclass of so-called simple LRS, which has some nice eigenvalue properties, is decidable. And what about general LRS? All they were able to show is that positivity for general LRS of order 5. So 5 is decidable with a complexity of co n p power p p power p p power p p. I mean for the complexity theorists guys, this is not so surprising because actually it comes from another result which already has all these things in. It, they just reduced to that paper and since that result on matrix iteration, that's I think, uh, yeah. Oh, no, 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 that's true. It's completely different. So uh, this is talk number two. So we have not linked up the two yet. Very good. Uh, that's going to be my next slide. So uh, so this is, I'm just saying that here is the another problem which is open but which has uh, received a lot of attention, right? And uh, ultimate positivity for order five, uh, so what, uh, yeah, so basically the bunch of other results. The only interesting thing is perhaps this one which says that if you actually show decidability of this column problem for order six, this would lead to some amazing breakthroughs in uh, uh, number theory. And you, everybody knows number theory is something, you know, it's a uh, little bit untouchable, right? Uh, but there are some things called the Diophantine approximation of uh, some numbers become easier or become possible if this were decidable. So essentially what it means is that if you solve this, you have solved a really, really hard problem, right? Uh, and the bottom line is, their best results, if you notice, is for 5, 6, and the simple restriction. So in full generality, this problem is still wide open, right? Uh, and now that brings me to uh, why are we interested in this? Why is this detour into this other thing? It turns out that uh, uh, these two problems are very strongly related. So uh, and in fact, so this is an alternative, uh, so this is a statement of uh, uh, the Markov reachability problem, which we saw. So given a finite stochastic matrix with rational, so now I've chosen rational, but I could choose rational, algebraic numbers, reals, integers. No, integers doesn't make sense in a Markov reachability. You need at least rational, but you can choose various other things there, uh, actually in this column problem. Uh, and if I take with rational entries, does there exist an n such that m power n, the 1 2 -th element is equal to r? That's the Markov reachability problem. And this column problem asks if, uh, given a k cross k matrix, does there exist an n such that, right? So uh, note this, I have restated it differently, right? So our, the, the, the sequence, you can now think of it as a matrix as well. So this, the link between a sequence and a matrix, I'm not going to go to here. It's an easy uh, exercise, uh, but you need a little bit of linear algebra, right? So uh, with a little bit of linear algebra, you can convince yourself that uh, this is the same as this column problem, which is, that I give you a k cross k integer rational real blah 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 matrix. Does there exist an n such that 
m power n 1 comma 2th entry is equal to 0. So, what are the differences as uh, uh, Ganesh already pointed out? Here it is stochastic, here it is not. Here there is an r sitting there, here there is a 0. These are pretty much the only uh, differences, but still it is not the same, right? And uh, what we managed to show and uh, uh, is explicitly that actually you can easily prove, and this is not a very even uh, hard exercise to show that the Markov reachability problem is as hard as this column problem, all right? So, I did have a sketch. Uh, so, in fact, yeah. So, in fact, we show that this column problem can be reduced to the reachability problem for Markov chains in polynomial time, okay? So, the proof is actually three slides, but I've put the first slide, uh, but I think I'm not going to describe it. So, uh, because there are many other results I'd like to give an overview of rather than describe this uh, thing, but it will be put up on the web. So, those of you who are interested, and it's there in my paper. So, it's a five page paper. So, you can, or eight page paper. I think. So, you can easily read this. Uh, the core idea is uh, to get rid of the negative values by the simple observation that any negative, any value, any real number can be written as the difference of two positive numbers. Right? I mean, come on, that is kind of, uh, I mean, for, uh, let us only restrict to rational numbers. So, in rational numbers, any rational number can be written as a difference of two rational numbers. And we use that observation and replace every entry of the matrix by a small 2 cross 2 matrix, where uh, the, the, whatever, the cross product actually gives you the value of the matrix, uh, value of the thing. And with this, you can actually show that by induction that actually this satisfies the property not only for the first value, but no matter which power you take, this property is still satisfied. So, this is the first step. And once you do this step, you've gotten rid of the negative entries in the matrix. The second step consists of rescaling because the entries are to be stochastic, you have to be values must be between 0 and 1. So, you rescale so that everything becomes uh, between 0 and 1. This you can do by adding one extra row and column. So, again, uh, it is not very, this part is not very difficult to figure out. And the third part, so when you do all this, what you get is that you do get exactly what you want. You get the matrix is stochastic, but this end vector that we want is not a very nice vector. It looks it has entries not only in 0, 1, but it has entry because you want it to be 0, 0, 0, 1 in the tth place, 0, 0, 0. And it turns out that is the hardest part. You get some other nonsense in that part because of this whole reduction. And how do you get rid of that it requires a little bit of uh, proof. So, this again I really do not want to talk about, but this uh, construction basically gives us that the, in the original matrix, uh, if the, uh, in fact, yeah, in the original matrix, this entry is 1, if and only if in the new matrix, some entry is 1 by 4. So, this basically becomes the proof uh, sketch, right? Uh, and this actually very, uh, sim I think, uh, uh, yeah, post facto, not very difficult proof, uh, shows that the Skolem problem is redu uh, reducible to the Markov reachability problem. And you can see that when I do this, actually the size of the matrix blows up in a quadratic way. So, I can get an exact bound on the blow up of the matrix. And so, the it does not become very large, that is what I am saying, right? And in fact, the same reduction works for positivity as well. And because of this, uh, we can actually see that uh, all, so basically, uh, this is kind of a shout out to people in formal methods who know various logics which have been defined over Markov chains. And it turns out there is a whole bunch of logics whose decidability was not known till now and now we can say that they were not known for a good reason, <laughs> including a logic which we had come up with. And this is actually the place where I got into this problem because we were interested in doing this logic for biological systems and so on uh, and uh, it turns out that we cannot do it, we have to resort to approximations and so on, all right? So, uh, and now we have a strong uh, result to say that, okay, this is not uh, no, I mean, it is not that we did not know it because we did not try too hard, it is really a hard problem, okay? So, model checking for all these logics is uh, Skolem hard, that is really the result. All right, so that is kind of uh, it and so let me quickly go through and really sketch the kind of results that we have managed to obtain about the trajectories and this should answer some of both uh, Ritsid's and uh, uh, Abiram's questions, all right? And uh, I break it up into two parts. One is about single trajectories and another is about sets of trajectories. Uh, and uh, so, I want to really rush through this so that I can tell you a little bit about program termination as well, all right? So, uh, here is the problem. 
again this is just I am recalling the problem and uh, first to answer uh, Abhiram's question, how hard are they? Are they always periodic? The, do the patterns, the trajectories from an initial point, uh, do they, do, uh, can I describe them in a periodic way or are they regular? And the first result is that uh, the trajectories may not be ultimately periodic. So it may be that they, uh, uh, there, uh, so yeah, so and this is not true for 2 cross 2 matrices. For 2 cross 2 matrices you can show that the trajectories must be actually periodic. And so the language, uh, so whatever, the, the trajectory must be uh, behaving very nicely. And uh, for uh, already for 3 cross 3 matrix, actually I think, ah, good. So uh, already for such a simple matrix, and said, note that this is my nice matrix. So even for a nice matrix in what I said, and even for a 3 cross 3 nice matrix, uh, and nice, I, here I mean that all entries are positive, strictly positive. Even for this matrix, if I start with this, ah, okay, so there is a slight typo, this should be a row vector and that I take the transpose of the matrix. So I switch notations a little bit there. Uh, so if I take this matrix, right, or its transpose, this is a ma perfect Markov chain. You can see that the, uh, whatever, the columns add up to 1 because we are taking the transpose. There is a slight typo here. Yeah, in this case we do not care, right. <laughs> so anyway, we have done the analysis for the, the transpose, but maybe for the row also it holds. So essentially, uh, oh, actually the reason is already given here. I thought I won't give this reason. But anyway, so the reason uh, is that if I start from this initial vector, and if I look th at this matrix, it turns out that uh, these are not going to be ultimately uh, uh, periodic. So these are ultimately aperiodic, and uh, you can even see this uh, when projected onto the first component. So if I look at just the first component, there itself I get a uh, ultimately aperiodic word. And uh, the reason for this intuitively, I mean not intuitively, the exact reason for this is that the eigenvalues of this are in a slightly bizarre way. And what is this bizarre way? Well, actually in this case they turn out to be, this is written in the polar form, whatever, right? So they turn out to be 1 uh, and something given in this slightly bizarre way. So the crux is that these are complex numbers. And they are not just any complex numbers, they are complex numbers having a certain slight complication property which is that they, uh, no power of them gives you a real number. So they do not form ro uh, roots of real numbers. So in fact what we found is that if you take uh, matrices in which uh, all the eigenvalues are indeed roots of real numbers, that is numbers whose power, they may be complex but their powers become real, uh, then every trajectory must be ultimately periodic. Uh, eventually, so it becomes, uh, uh, so it, it starts repeating. So A power n, B power n is still ultimately periodic. So, so you can have an automaton for it, right? So, uh, uh, which is an if and only if? Uh, no, it's not. Every trajectory is ultimately periodic. Then the roots should be real numbers. No, that's not true. Yeah, this is a, a sufficient condition in that. Yeah. Okay, so therefore we get as a corollary that Mark Markov reachability problems are decidable for this whole class of Markov chain uh, whose eigenvalues are roots of real numbers. Only the reachability problems from single trajectories, right? Uh, uh, and uh, next, uh, okay, it's 6:30, so let me try to actually wind up uh, without going into the results. So, uh, so I'm not going to give you the results here. I'm just going to point out that we have some approximation results which say that if you want to not look at the exact value but uh, approximately how it behaves even with languages we can show regularity, right? And uh, this is the latest work we have in this and this was done uh, with some collaborators in France as well as uh, a BTEC student who is not here. Uh, I think they have a tutorial today, huh? see? So, so uh, at this time, so, uh, so this is Nikhil Vyas and what we managed to show is two results. One is if all eigenvalues are distinct positive real numbers, then the symbolic language, that language itself must be regular. And now you may ask what if it's, uh, for the trajectories we had this result, right? If they are roots of real numbers, then things are still nice, right? So if they are uh, uh, roots of real numbers, things are still nice. Does that continue here? And in fact, we were able to show that 
that is not true. There is a Markov chain whose eigenvalues are distinct roots of real numbers, but the language is not regular. So that is where uh, the languages and the trajectories also start differing, right. And uh, yeah, so the source of difficulty, I think we have seen enough sources of difficulty. Uh, so let me quickly uh, jump to one slide on program termination and then I stop. Is that fine? Or All right. So I have just one more, uh, actually one and a half slides. Okay, so so this is uh, basically what we have done, right? So we looked at some trajectories. So I really didn't have time to go into this, but uh, I hope this part till here was clear. And the last thing I want to do is kind of motivate a completely different, yet another third press, uh, thread, right? So I could have again started the talk here. So here is a, a third beginning for the talk, right? Consider the problem of termination. So everybody knows what is program termination. So uh, this is the classical Turing uh, problem. And uh, if you take a general problem, while some condition is true, something happens. Uh, this is, of course, undecidable whether this pro program terminates or not. Now consider a much simpler case. And here is the case I consider. I just look at linear programs. So programs whose command is just updating by applying a linear function on top of it. All right. And uh, the program actually, what does it say? It says start with an initial vector, some vector b. And while some condition is true, and the condition is also given by some linear constraint. So C transpose X is greater than 0, update, do this linear transformation, right? Uh, and uh, question is, as an instance of this program, given B, C, and A, uh, is the termination problem decidable or not? And now, by now, I hope nobody has any doubts that where we are going next, this problem is as hard as the positivity problem. In fact, it is equivalent to the positivity problem. So because you can think of, uh, yeah, oh, I have it, yeah, good. So can rewrite this as for all n, is it the case that C transpose dot a power n dot b is greater than 0, right? So really what we have been talking about is linear program termination, right? And that is not any different from any of the other problems we have been looking at, right? Uh, and that is the positivity. What about suppose I drop this x equal to b and suppose I say uh, what about the uninitialized case? That is does there exist a b such that this is true? So is there an initial vector such that the program terminates or does not terminate? It turns out that this problem is in, in fact decidable. And uh, this was proved in two papers. So actually, it was proved originally in CAV 2014 over the reals, where entries are all real values. And it was lifted to uh, uh, the case of rationals and a subcase of, uh, uh, of integers by Braverman in uh, 2006. And uh, it was really, uh, uh, again, two very nice papers worth reading. And the latest result was another small improvement in this uh, in SODA last year, I think. Right? Yeah, I think the, that was again by uh, Joel Avakinen and James Worrell. So that is basically uh, all I want to say. So uh, we have basically looked at probabilistic verification and several hardness results, regularity results. And uh, the problems here require an interplay of a lot of theoretical ideas and they have a lot of applications. I hope you are all convinced of that at least. And they have a lot of links. One thing I did not have talk, time to talk about is the link uh, with a completely different domain. <laughs> I mean, it is not really, of course, uh, of uh, uh, Petri nets and other transition systems and why these things are there. We have completely not broached on it. And uh, what Sid was saying, uh, one thing we have not touched upon is what happens if you have continuous time Markov chains? So either way, what happens about them? And uh, it, uh, so there are some uh, recent results, which I think are appearing last year and this year. Uh, I don't know uh, uh, whether they have even been published yet by the same group of uh, uh, the people from Oxford who have shown that even in the continuous case, uh, they have some few positive uh, results, but very few. And everywhere else, it becomes as hard. And uh, so these are like really state of the art. They're, I don't know exactly what the latest uh, is because it's not yet been published. I know it has been submitted. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Hmm. 
Uh, not yet. So the uh, only thing I'd be interested is: Do you are you interested in the problem of what happens in finite time? Does there exist a finite time at which something happens? That's really the crux of the thing here. Not the limit. You are. Oh, so then I'm very interested to talk. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. This is the kind of thing I would like to do offline. So currently we have, as you can see, we have found links to program terminal. I mean, we. Uh, this links are not found by me. I mean, the links were already there. This particular Markov reachability to Skolem was perhaps the only link I was a part of, but. You can see that there are links between uh, various things, and I would like to add something like this. So I'm not surprised. Uh, that much I can say because this problem is an underlying, very, very general problem. So it should pop up in more places. So I'd like to see where else uh, it, it does pop up. And if uh, you have such pointers, I would be most happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I see. Okay. okay, we'll talk about this offline. Okay. Okay, great. So, as you can see, the last point is that th this area has problems from puzzles to BTP MTP projects to PhD problems to a long-standing open problem which can make your career. So. There you go. Thanks.